Chapter 6 I have but a confused memory of the next few hours. The abbots sent out groups of terrified monks to interview equally terrified peasants, while Master Lee hastened to perform an autopsy. There might be some poison that dissipated inside of a few hours, but all Master Lee discovered was that Brother Shang had been in excellent shape, and had expired from a heart attack. The monks returned with the news that at least eight peasants had seen mysterious monks in robes of motley, who laughed and danced beneath the moon, and who disappeared as though the earth had swallowed them. The other piece of news was that one more section of Prince's path appeared to be destroyed. Master Lee tossed his knives down beside the corpse of Brother Shang and said we had better get a few hours sleep. It seemed only minutes before he shook me awake again and handed me a cup of strong tea, and then we set out to meet Prince Liu Pao. He was standing forlornly on Prince's path, and once more we gazed at the impossible. Nothing lived in a swath of approximately fifty by one hundred and fifty feet. Death had cut cleanly. Flowers bloomed beside withered ones, and sap dripped from healthy trees not ten feet from trees whose sap had been sucked right out of them. Again I thought of a cemetery and a nightmare, but something in the pattern of it caused me to frown and sketch shapes in the air. Both Master Lee and the Prince watched me with widening eyes, and I blushed. Do that again, Master Lee commanded. I repeated the patterns. Lil Cow? Li Kao, am I losing my mind? the prince asked. I could swear that number ten ox is sketching scholar shorthand for antique great seal script, which hasn't been in common usage for a thousand years. Ox is capable of the damnedest things, Master Li muttered. Right now he's capable of sketching the ancient characters for love, strength, and heaven. And I know perfectly well he doesn't understand a single great seal ideograph. Well, boy, are you going to keep us in suspense? I turned bright red. <clears throat> I, I had a dream, I said humbly, just before you woke me up. Something in this scene reminded me of it, and it had strange patterns. I had dreamed that I was sitting on the grass near a village very like my own. Somebody had attached a bamboo pole and a black flag to the gears of the grindstone at the water wheel, as we did in my village, because the gears kept slipping. Farmers could glance up from the fields and see if the flag was pumping up and down, and if it wasn't, a boy would be sent to get Big Hong the blacksmith to reset the gears. As the black flag rose to the apex, it flared out and hovered in the air for a moment before starting back down. Children were playing in front of the water wheel. One little girl was jumping up and down. Her long black hair lifted up into the air and hovered for a moment before settling down to her shoulders. In front of the children were butterflies fluttering among some reeds. One was black, and it swooped up, paused, hovered, and then fluttered back down. The black flag, black hair, and black butterfly formed a neatly straight line that pointed toward my feet. I looked down and saw a small, round, orange-colored piece of clay. My hand reached out and closed around it, and something told me to keep watching the pattern. Up, pause, down. Up, pause, down. My fingers tingled. The piece of clay had a heartbeat, and it was the rhythm of the pattern. And an ache filled my heart, and tears filled my eyes. Up, pause, down. Kung, shang. I was not hearing the wonderful sound, but feeling it in the pulse of a piece of clay. And then I was in my old classroom in the monastery, and a bunch of boys were looking at me with eyes like owls, and I was desperately trying to explain something very important. Don't you understand, I said? The life force of a round piece of orange-colored clay is like a flag, and a butterfly, and a little girl's hair. Up, pause, down, up. Pause down. The important thing to remember is the pause. Can't you understand that? The boy stared at me solemnly. It's the pause, I yelled. It isn't like the heartbeat of a person, and you'll never hear the wonderful sound it makes unless you understand the pause. The old abbot was shuffling toward me. 
Then he came closer, and he wasn't the abbot at all. He was Master Lee, and he grabbed my shoulders and shook me and screamed furiously, Number ten ox, you couldn't teach a banana to turn black. Then I woke up. <clears throat> uh, sir, that, that's all I can tell you about the dream, I said. Something in this scene reminded me of it and the pattern it took. That tall dead tree, then a space, then lower dead trees, then a space, then bushes. I shrugged and sketched in the air. And you draw ancient scholars' ideographs for love, and you draw ancient scholars' ideographs for love, strength, and heaven, Master Lee said thoughtfully. Are you quite positive that the round piece of clay was colored orange? Yes, sir, I said. He scratched his nose and chewed thoughtfully on the tip of his mangy beard. That may be obvious, that may be looking into when we have the time, he said. The symbolism is obvious, but it leads to a swamp I'd rather stay away from. Master Lee started looking for traces of mysterious monks in Motley, and I started gathering more plants and soil samples. And just then the, the drums began. Sheepskin drums, hundreds of them pounding softly, but methodically from all over the Valley of Sorrows. The prince looked at Master Lee with raised eyebrows, but Master Lee jerked his head in my direction. When it comes to the ways of peasants, ask the expert, he said. I flushed again. <coughs> uh, your Highness, they're going to blackmail you, I said meekly. E eh? Uh, blackmail isn't quite right, but I don't know the proper word, I said. They're going to start a work song. It's older than time, and it's used by peasants when they want the Lord of the Valley to do something. What Lord of what valley? the prince said angrily. Master Lee kindly stepped in to help me. The peasants think your ancestor is behind this, and so far as they are concerned, you're Lord of the Valley, whether you like it or not. The headmen are preparing the chant that details the peasants' duties to the Lord, and thus implies the Lord's duties to the peasants. Ox, how many verses are there? Over four hundred, I said. When they get to the end, they'll start all over again, and they can keep it up for a year, if need be. I didn't add that in their place I'd uh, do the same thing myself. Confucius thought so highly of the blackmail song that he put part of it in the Book of Odes, and it's really very effective when the drums go boom, boom, boom. In the fifth moon we gather wild plums and cherries. In the sixth moon we boil mallow and beans. In the seventh moon we dry the dates. In the eighth moon we take the rice to make with it the spring wine, so our Lord may be granted long life. In the sixth moon we pick the melons. In the seventh moon we cut the gourds. In the eighth moon we take the seeding hept. We bather, gather bitter herbs. We cut alianto for firewood that our Lord may eat. The chanting is without emotion, except for the last line of every third verse, and after a few months of it, the subject begins to cringe with each third when each third verse starts. It's hard for a lord to justify chopping off insolent heads. It's just a work song. Boom, boom, boom. In the eighth moon, we make ready the stockyards. In the ninth moon, we bring in the harvest, mill it for wine, mill it for cooking, the early and the late. Paddy and hemp, beans and wheat, my lord, the harvesting is over. We begin work on your houses. In the morning we gather thatch reeds. In the evening we twist ropes. We work quickly on the roofs, for soon we will sow the lord's many grains. How can they do this to me? the prince said plaintively. They know very well that my family hasn't collected a copper coin or grain of rice for centuries. Boom, boom. In the days of the first, we cut ice with tingling blows. In the days of the second, we bring it to the cold shed. In the days of the third, very early, we offer pigs and garlic that our Lord may eat. In the tenth month, our shrewd frosts, we clear the stackyards. With twin pitchers, we hold the village feast, killing for it a spring lamb. Up we go to our Lord's hall. Raise the drinking cups of buffalo horn. Hurrah for our Lord! May he live forever and ever! They'll keep that up for a year, the prince said. I think I know what they want, but I'd prefer to have it explained to me. You and you alone have the right to dispose of your ancestor in the old way, Master Lee said gently. By the old way, they mean pre-Confucian which is punishable by torment in the eighth hell, the prince said angrily. 
Yes, according to our Neo-Confucian overlords, who also impose upon rivals the sacred duty of retiring from public life for three years after the death of a father, and then they poison the father, Master Li said sardonically. Prince Liu Pao was made from tough stuff. He turned without another word and began marching up Dragon's left horn toward his estate. He turned off the path and took a shortcut to the grotto. The horror of the medical research center seemed even worse with the muffled sounds of drums and chanting in the distance. The prince opened the door to the tomb and marched inside to the sarcophagus of his ancestor. Ox, can you get the lid all the way down? I spat on my hands. The lid was so heavy I couldn't stop it after it slid down to the mummy's feet, and it crashed to the floor. Prince Liu Pao stood looking down at the remains of his ancestor, and Master Li beckoned for me to open the other sarcophagus. "'While we're at it, I want to look for something,' he said. The lid was easier to move, and the mummy of Tao Wan, the laughing prince's wife, was intact. Master Li reached inside and came up with some jewellery, which he examined closely. "'Good stuff, but not the best,' he said thoughtfully. "'Tao Wan was said to have been a spendthrift of epic proportions, "'and I doubt that this would have met her standards. "'One wonders whether their highnesses might not have been buried by a light-fingered steward.' "'He stood there, scratching his forehead. "'Strange,' he muttered. "'The laughing prince apparently worshipped a stone, "'and possibly his wife also did, "'yet the stone wasn't included in either coffin. "'The faithful steward again?' A sound made us turn. The prince was struggling to lift his ancestor's mummy from the coffin. The tarred wrappings made it heavy and awkward. I stepped forward to help, but Master Li held me back. Prince Liu Pao was sweating heavily, but he kept going. Through the tomb, through the grotto, and outside to the path. He turned off the path and carried the mummy to a flat, jutting rock overlooking the Valley of Sorrows. Every eye must have been lifted there. The drums stopped. The prince searched for a heavy rock, and I closed my eyes. I kept them closed while I listened to ancient bones splintering. But I opened them too soon and saw the rock descend on the skull and smash it to pieces. A white cloud of crushed and powdered bones drifted down to the valley, followed by the scraps of linen from the wrappings, and then by the stone used for the sacrifice. I have seldom admired anyone as much as I admired Prince Liao Pao. He turned towards us and managed to keep his voice steady. According to Cao Cao, my next step on the path to damnation is either to violate my sister or fail to return for my mother's funeral. But I can't remember which comes first, he said. The mother, said Master Li, takes precedence, but I wouldn't be so sure about damnation if I were you, Prince. This time the criminals have made a very bad mistake. "'and the mummy of your ancestor puts the seal on it. "'You and I have something interesting to talk about.' "'From below came one last roll of sheepskin drums. "'Hurrah for our Lord! "'May he live forever and ever!'